How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk, and I'm making music as Afro DJ Mac. And today I have the opportunity to talk to Jesper Nordin, who is a composer from Sweden and also the developer of a really awesome new app for the iPad, Gestrument Pro. What's up, Jesper? How are you today? I'm perfectly fine. It's a, it's a late night here in Sweden, but it's, a, it's, it's fine. It's been a, a nice two days. We just released the app uh, two days ago, so it's, it's, it's going well. Yeah, and I appreciate you taking the time to stop by and talk, and um, also at the late hour, I know we have the slight time difference, so thanks very much for that. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so it's been kind of exciting, I imagine, in your world right now, because in my news feed and all the stuff that comes through me, I'm seeing gesturement everywhere. It's <laughs> That's good. Everyone's That's good. talking about it. Um, Discord, Tim Webb, uh, all, the, all the blogs I follow, it seems like everyone's excited about gesturement. So congrats. Yeah, I, I think that, that what's, uh, because this is, uh, we, we released the, the first version of gesturement uh, six years ago. So it's, it's the, the basic concept that's been there for a while. And I developed the, the original tool I don't know what it was, 2007 or something like that, for, for myself. So the, the, the ideas have been around for quite some time, but uh, it's, for us, it's really now that we find uh, a way to, to go deep into this and to really make it uh, something that, that we think will be possible to expand in so many different ways, mm -hmm. both for professional musicians, but also in, in, in other areas of, of music and, and entertainment and, and expression in many different ways. So it's right. really exciting. Yeah, and it's what I really like about Gesturement is it's making use of the touch screen really well. So there's so many apps that are out there, and, and some of them are great, don't get me wrong, but they kind of are emulating real world things like knobs you would turn or faders, and it just never feels quite right, or rarely, I should say. Um, but you're really using the concept of the screen and and touching it, it feels like something, you couldn't have it really in the actual world. You, you sort no, of- exactly. the face. We, we actually, we, we just had, well, at the release party yesterday, we just had some, some uh, high level uh, musicians here from Sweden saying, you need to go into hardware. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so of course you can have it there as well in, in, in one way or the other. And we use it a lot with, with the motion sensors and controlling it from, from other, other uh, other control sources in different ways. Uh, so of course it's not it's not that it has to be on the iPad, but but it was conceived. My my first tool was with a Wacom tablet in 2007. So mm -hmm. it was a Wacom tablet and a Max patch that I did. Oh, wow. uh, so it's always been a screen uh, that I was playing on or drawing on actually yeah. in that way. Uh, so of course it, it it comes natural to to this screen. And I think that why I don't think it's the screen itself, but it is. To, to have a different way of inputting and to, to, in, uh, to working with music. Mm -hmm. think about it. Because I think mean, just one sentence, it would be that it's dead center between being an instrument and being a composition. You can set all the rules for a composition, you can define so many different things, but you can still play on it. So it's really, yeah, and that's, a, that's an area that I haven't seen many people or many, many apps or, or, or technologies trying to, to delve into that. I think that's really interesting. I think so too. And my initial interaction with it um, was a little different and maybe like a little more the way I kind of think of things where I sort of set up my kind of rules, you know, like the, the theory, like these are my boundaries that I have. And then I've, I'm coming up with music where... I'm, I'm writing the music, I'm composing it as I go. But I watched your Polar talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was from June. And the way you explained it was a way I hadn't thought about it yet, where you actually input the rules of the composition theory-wise, so mm -hmm. the notes were allowed to play the chords and all the sounds. And then you're kind of like playing within the composition. So you had Furley's... You, you set it up in Thanks. there and then you're kind of like, okay, it's almost like in a way, like a remix, I guess. Yeah. Uh, let me put that up, uh, the, the, that preset, because I think that's a really good example of, of what you can do. Uh, so in, in the instrument, uh, you have uh, lots of instruments. You can go up into to 16 instruments as we have it now. 
-hmm. and they can be monophonic or they can be chords in, 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 in different ways. What I usually do is that I, I keep them monophonic even if I have, like for instance, I, I want to play the piano. So instead of having trying to do one, one piano with, with the multiple fingers, I do five pianos with, that are all monophonic. Uh, and so I have a, a piano improvisation preset that I made that sounds... So you have to change scales while I play and I fiddle around with that. It's fun to play with. It's a little Keith Jarrett-ish, like in, in style, if you want to. <laughs> but then uh, the fun thing, when we, we speak a lot about, uh, as I said, you said, the, the rules of the music or the musical DNA, if you want to, is something that is like moldable and, and changeable in real time. That is not just a scale or, or rhythmic pattern or things like that, but it's even, even deeper and has even more aspects. And one thing is then to, instead of using a scale, using a, a melody or a MIDI file. Mm. And instead of having the touch screen going from low to high pitches, well, when, you, when you play on it, you go from the beginning to the end of the melody, which is an architectural way of looking at music, uh, coming from contemporary music world where I live, where I, where I, where I work. That, that's a very common way of, of thinking about music, to think of it structurally and, and architecturally and, and just look at it from different angles and using canonic utilities and things like that to, 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 to delve into it. But to be able to do that in real time and play on that, I think that's the, 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 the new thing. So if, instead of having these scales that I played first, instead I, I, I take in Beethoven's Fidelis. And I do, as you said, a remix. But of course it will, it's in, almost impossible to, to do a good version of Fidelis or any lullaby or whatever kind of tune you want. It's not an instrument for playing existing music. We have instruments, but the yeah. pianos or the violins or whatever. <clears throat> it's to, to take the rules and to do something new with that or within that. So taking a, a, a theme or a type of music or a genre or style or whatever you want to call it or a sound that you know that you like or that you think that you like and then experiment with that and, and, and see if you can surprise yourself. So here, if I take Fidelis and I take it in the same piano setting as I had before and start to improvise over that. You hear the sound world, you recognize the tune, but not. Uh, so it's really like uh, working with, with, with a type of material, but then fiddling around with it in a different way. And I, for me, this is really, as a composer, this is a fantastic approach. I can take something that I know that I have a connection to and that I like somehow, and then I'm just with it. But I don't have to do it directly. I can do it in real time intuitively with my ears. And that's what I really like about it. Right. It gives me this feeling. It's almost like it's the way you remember a song, kind of, where it's this almost like dream state version of the song where it's in there, but it's the way our memories kind of fog up and recolor. And, you know, they say every time we remember something, we change the story a little bit. And it's like, the, you would pick the song out, but you would also say, but I don't remember that part. I don't, you know, where does that go from there? Oh, that's, that's fantastic that you, that you put it that way. Because before I invented the gesturement, uh, when I was working with other, other ways of, of composing, <clears throat> I wrote a piece called Residues, mm -hmm. where I used a small music of a uh, traditional folk traditions. Uh, there are there is a song after my grandfather's grandfather's grandfather uh, in the, the uh, late uh, what, uh, 18th, 17th, 18th century, something a very, very long time ago. So I have the folk music in me. So I've used that a lot in my compositions. And this residues uh, was some kind of something, a phrase or a word that I kept using to describe my music. So finally I wrote a piece called that. And uh, when people ask me, but how do you use the folk music? I can't hear the tune in there. No. And that's ex and I used almost exactly the the, the uh, analogy that you just did. 
I, I said, if you take 10 folk musicians, if you put them in a cathedral, and you have them play one or even one song each, just like lots and lots of folk music, and then you take away the musicians, that's what I'm after. Mm -hmm. Just the resonance, just, just the residues. You, you hear it's there, but you can't really touch it. It's not tangible. Right. So, so it's, it's always been a, a, an aim that that kind of, of sound world is something that I'm, that I'm really interested in. Hmm. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> I always feel sometimes too, when I do write a song, it's this like kind of approximation of what I'm going for, where it's, I might have like this thing, yeah, like, I know what I want. But then like when you kind of like finalize it, whether you mm -hmm. record it or be, it becomes a performance, it's suddenly like, it's like kind of what I was going for. <laughs> you know? In my head, like it had all these other different kind of angles and places it went. But um, this is almost a way to deconstruct or reconstruct and bring out that sort of like, kind of like a like suburb of the song <laughs> that's <laughs> a good good like good this outside to aura that's exactly. missed uh, actually what i've been as, as a composer how i've used this technology is to be able to come outside of myself somehow because if i write something that i know that i like i copy myself or someone else if i do think, things that i didn't know that i liked that's where I'm really like heading for. That's like, oh, wow, this is great. I didn't know I liked that. And that's a fantastic feeling when you have that. Uh, and it happens a lot when, with, with this kind of technology for me. Because yes, I set the rules and I set the, the parameters. But then, oh, I didn't think about I would never thought of that if I would just be sitting with pen and paper or a piano or something. So it's really like to open new paths, but still having control over, over the direction. Right. I, well, I think that's why I have so many like synthesizers around me and, <laughs> and uh, uh, different MIDI controllers and guitars and stuff because uh, they all kind of force me to write a little differently. Exactly, yeah. The ideas come out in a different way. And I, I really like what you say about that idea of like, I didn't know I liked that. You're sort of like tricking yourself into not just doing what you like because it's it's like already what you like. And you said you mm -hmm. copy yourself or someone else. And for me, that part, that exploration part of music is one of my favorite parts about it. Yeah, definitely. Even if it's just the sound design too. Yeah. Um, I really love that. And I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you about that. And um, just, I guess, obviously, gesturement is a way that you're using that to kind of find these new things you didn't know you liked. Yeah, definitely. How, what what methods do you use to do that? Is there anything else? Is gesturement the ultimate tool for that, or do you have other ways to surprise yourself? Uh, yeah, I think w before I had gesturement, I, I used many different ways of doing it. The one thing, because uh, if I just go back and say something briefly about my background into music, I started quite late. Uh, so, so for a classical musician, I started far too late <laughs> i didn't learn how to read the right music until i was in my 20s so i started playing punk rock when i was like 16 or something so just some 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 friends building up and uh, starting a band uh yeah, luckily, two, um, <laughs> yeah two, luckily two of them were were proper musicians then they started they started another band called entombed that became a, a huge uh fresh metal or, or which sort of type of metal they, they were out of country let's say but uh, they were really good musicians so i was lucky to be able to, to play with them and uh, then my my it was really like i didn't practice i never became a musician but i wrote songs and they grew bigger and bigger and bigger and finally i just needed these tools to to be able to to compose them somehow but when i then started studying composition properly and i was uh, started doing studies at the royal conservatory in stockholm i became very traditional uh, and i didn't really i wasn't really interested in electroacoustic music or those kind of things because it, I, I had In the, in the class since I came so late to it. I think I was much more traditional than, than my classmates. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was really looking back, backwards uh, in time to, to find some way of, of the, to doing my music, but in this context. And then they actually they forced us finally to, to take electroacoustic music as, as, a, as a subject. And I thought, okay, I'll do that. And it was like coming home. It was really like coming home. I was in the studio. I knew the studio tools from, from playing rock music. I knew all, those, the, all, all, all that technology. 
and I could become the musician. I could phrase things and I could really listen and use my ears. Mm -hmm. so, so several things stood out for me then. It was, the main thing was that I need to listen. That is what I am. Uh, I love working on the score and I write quite detailed scores and I work a lot with the scores, but I don't want to make my first fundamental musical choices on paper. I want to make them with my ears. So that was one, one key thing I learned. Yeah, I, this, this, this deficiency or the, the, the problem that I have that I'm coming, coming late to the classical music scene and not, not like, not, of course, now I studied for ages and worked in it for a long time, but, but still feeling that I didn't play through all the orchestra repertoire. There's so many things that I'm still feel a little bit behind. Uh, that means that I need to, to, as I said, trick myself. Yeah, because if, if, I, if, I, if you have a shallow knowledge of something, then you're more... Uh, you're bound to imitate on a shallower level. If you know something more deeper, then you can you can go and you can be freer inside of it. So I tried to earlier. I tried to trick myself in this way. I tried. I recorded the musicians, and I took the samples, <coughs> mapped it on the keyboard in a more or less random fashion. Uh, so I had lots of, of string sounds or vocals uh, pitches, but, it, but it, they were not on the right keys. So then I sat at the keyboard playing just listening. Okay, that's a nice chord, that's a nice chord. And <clears throat> I, it could have been a C major, but it, it didn't feel like a C major because I didn't play on the C major triad. So, so it was really like, right. just to be able to listen and listen and listen. And, 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 and then you found some new things that I wouldn't have found otherwise. So I, that was really uh, a way that I've always been, been using to, to, to find new paths for, for, for something that, that uh, is there all, all the time in, in, inside of you that you just want to find new, new outlets for it. Mm, I like that method. I think <laughs> a lot of times I, um, with my music, I will try to be intelligent about what I'm doing, right? Or like, or I might be like, um, it, it definitely comes from like a self-conscious thing, you know? Mm. And um, I might come up with something I like and then say oh but that's you know like you said that's a C major it's a very simple chord and it goes to the four and the five and every song does that and I'll I'll almost throw an idea away because I, some silly like snob in my brain that is saying you can't do that you know now that's the thing that I found with with using the instrument uh, or the original version when I started I have definitely uh, been writing more complex music mm -hmm. and I've been writing so much more simpler music. Hmm. I've been going in both directions because I've been using my ears only. So some things are, I would never have been writing that if I was just using the score, just, just sitting at the keyboard because it just feels and looks too simple. But yeah. it sounds good, so I'm here and I'm gonna use it. Uh, and to the other end as well, uh, I can control complexity in a completely new way. So I can feel that, it, it, just writing lots of notes on, on, on paper, it's like, okay, it, it feels a little bit random, but here I can, okay, this is super complex, but this is exactly how I want it. Uh, so you can have the control uh, and, and play on it. So I, it's really been taking my music in, in both these directions, with that, which I really, really like. It's been opening up uh, the expression in that way. Yeah. I, as a guitar player, one of the tricks we'll do sometimes is change the tuning of our strings. So it just breaks those yeah, patterns. True. Yeah, and if you kind of like don't really know what is going to happen anymore. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's nice. yeah, then sometimes you're like surprised when you like kind of figure it out again and you're like, oh, that's actually something I never would have done or, or it is even just a simple chord progression that I would have not done because I feel like I have to be all fancy about it. <laughs> okay. Oh, definitely. I think the like emotional reaction from music really doesn't care about the complexity of the no. music. Or, or the simplicity or like in, in both directions. And, yeah. and of course, everything is, is uh, based on previous knowledge and references. The first time you hear a Gamelan song, uh, you have no idea what's happening. It's like, wow, what was that? And, and you, you can't, because it's, it's totally upside down. Uh, the one is at the end, like the heavy beat is at the end. Everything is completely upside down. The tuning is different. And then if you, if you go into that and you listen a little bit more, then wow, this is fantastic. It's, it's really subtle and, and very, very nice music. Mm. The first time I, I listened to thrash metal with those friends in the, in the first band, they tried to play some, some early Metallica. I had never listened to that. And it's like, what is this? I can't, I, I don't understand it at all. 
And then finally, I found one way, like one song that I liked, that album, and then things opened up, and then you, then you like the genre. So it's that is it's, it's something that that needs to be done in, in all the genres and places that you define the path in. And some some genres you're not interested in finding a path into. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I think that that uh, just thinking about the reference points uh, always when you think about music is super important mm-hmm. because otherwise you, you you said about fancy or not fancy it's one of those things that yes some some music like some wines might uh, take some while for you to to get used to and to 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 find the, the the refinement of it and some people don't want to do it and it's perfectly fine and some people want to do it and that's also perfectly fine mm-hmm. <laughs> both ways are are, are, are valid uh, you just have to be be conscious of that both ways are as acceptable and, and both ways exist right. because I, I it's very seldom that you hear people say I, I usually take food as an example because at least here in Sweden uh, contemporary music is scorned quite a lot of, of this elitist uh, uh, approach as you say that people think that it's too snobby that it's just just for a few people but they would never say the same thing about food hmm. Uh, no one would, because here there's some politician brag the uh, simplest uh, novels and, and uh, crime crime novels and stuff like that, and, and, and you only listen to ABBA. But they would never say, I only go to McDonald's. <laughs> never, never, ever. Uh, so why why is that? Why is it acceptable in some parts to have refinement on the highest level and uh, something that is not for everyone, but it's still everyone knows, even if you don't like uh, high-end cuisine, you know that it's good and that it's, okay, yeah, we, 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 we understand it. Why is it not the same for music or for art? Uh, and that's uh, something that I think is really, really important to keep in mind. Hmm. That is a great point. I mean, it's, you can eat any, everyone eats and everyone can eat any kind of food they want. And same thing, you're right with yeah. that. That's cool. You talk about gesturement um, as like lowering the kind of uh, barrier or like the threshold for people to get into making music. And you can definitely see it when you, especially you've got a jazz preset in there. That's pretty cool. And it's like a yeah. drummer and a bass player and a, and a pianist. Exactly. And I can play pull it up. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's so neat and it's, it's jazz from a distance of course uh-huh. but it's there you understand it and you see it and you as i said it's 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 in the in between you, you define the rules so you hear more or less the genre but you can still play it so it's really like somewhere in, in, in between yeah and i think that's got to be satisfying for someone just coming into it without any musical background that they can kind of start moving their fingers around and feel like they're actually doing something that we we have so many testimonials people saying like so this is a music thing, uh, an ipad showing a, 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 his wife or her husband uh, okay who's not music musician okay then how about this and they're like, oh wow i can play music and people just go go crazy about it and or for for kids or for, for people who are just like oh this is fun and you're drawn into it so that's yeah. definitely a uh, area of interest for us to see where, where we can take that the the, the easy uh, the, the easy approach of, of this interaction but for for this app just when pro we wanted to go in the other direction to see how far can we take the concept how how, how far can we go with uh, having everything morphable and ch- changeable in real time and everything mappable to each other so so that's the path we took now and then we'll try to, to take other paths in the future to, to simplify things and to, to have uh, more of the, the, as you said, l- l- low threshold, uh, low barrier for, for, for entrance for people. And I think both ways are, are very interesting for me. But they, of course, they, 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 it's a completely different audience. So you need to focus on one at a time. Right. And, and I think your point is really interesting that as we get more and more technology, it does make it easier to enter, but we also don't want to simplify the art too much and take away from the potential. Exactly. At least to, to keep some doors open, even if it's simple, you can do some things directly, but if there's a door to open, 
and to, to, to keep going, to, to, to pique the interest of maybe one in 10, maybe one in 100, but still you'll have those people who, who go, go deeper. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's not blocked. There are so many simple technologies that are blocked uh, where you can't go any further. So, okay, this is what you do, and it's simple, and it works well, fine. And that is, is of course, that's not a problem. You, you need to have those as well. But if you have something, okay, when well, you can go deeper, you know, garage band, whatever, is, is a typical example of that. Yeah, it's simple, simplified the door, and you can do it. But it's still there. There are doors to open, and there are more things to learn. So it's, it's uh, I think that's, uh, for me at least, that's the most interesting way of using technology. Mm. Well, I had the garage band experience today. I, I'm a high school English teacher by day. Okay. So um, I started a music production club at my school and I'm waiting on some software, but they have garage band. And it was nice to be able to just say, all right, everyone, here are the loops. You know, you can just drag these on and they all kind of always sound good together <laughs> and they can play. And the people that are new to even that concept there were a lot of people that didn't understand music had tracks yeah exactly. record things separately so they're coming to terms with those realizations but then there are other people it's like all right let's you get this already so let me show you another layer and take yeah, exactly. it further and it was fun that i was able to kind of keep um the new people from getting frustrated mm -hmm. and also the people a little more advanced still keep them excited about what they were doing too yeah, no, that's great. Hmm. And I, I could see that in gesturement because, like, it's it's immediate. You're immediately making music. This is the yeah. first time you lay your finger down. But once you start clicking on those little tabs on the side, and then you start unpacking all of the options and the speed of the notes and the keys, and it's yeah. really nice how how it satisfies like both of those styles of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. And let's see where, where we can take it because it's, it's also uh, my, my vision, if I like a, a large vision, is that I think or I want or and I think <laughs> that music will be a, more interactive in the future and not just because music is interactive if you're a musician. You can play anything you want and it's, it's interactive. But music is for the fans love and want to interact more with the music but they don't have an instrument. Maybe they're physically unable to play an instrument, maybe they didn't take the effort to do it or, or whatever, uh, but to be able to still have some kind of interaction with, with your favorite music, to, to, to have all the artists release their music interactively. And some, some have already tried going that path a little bit with, with the releasing music as apps, Bjork and Radiohead, examples yeah, of that. Thinking of that. But yeah. not so much of musical interaction in those. Uh, fantastic apps, both of them, and, and, and they, they were very successful and, and rightly so. But to, to be able to, to find a kind of new, new way of, of, of really in, in interacting with, with the audience when they are also participating, uh, maybe it comes from this kind of blockchain idea, blockchain ideas that are floating around everywhere right now. Uh, to, to have something where you can like build new things on top of it and, and keep going. I think that this technology could be found the foundation for something like that in the future. Mm, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> that is a cool way to think about it. I gotta say, um, for a very long time, I've you know I've seen um, you know over the last couple of years, people are using um, like the Connect camera and doing kind of like um, body movement to control filters on a synthesizer and things like that. Um, personally, I've never really seen much use for it, like practically speaking. Like it's cool that you can, you know, do your filter cutoff like this. But I, as far as like if I was going to go perform, I was like, mm, is it, why? It is, you know, I'll do it two times in the show. And then after that, it's kind of like a, a gimmick. Yeah. But I must say, um, in watching what you're doing, you have the clarinet player, who is also the conductor. I, I understand, I believe, right? And he, kind he's, of. We, he, he has. A, it's, it's a multi-layer project that we did. So it's a Martin First, who is really the world leading clarinet player. Uh, we we have one version of this project where he is also conducting the mm -hmm. the orchestra. Uh, so it's for chamber orchestra. We did it in, in the U.S. with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. That was actually the premiere, the world premiere. Fantastic chamber orchestra. It's really, really high level. Uh, 
uh, and then he conducted it. But then we also have a, a different uh, like version of the same project uh, with uh, it's a Pekasal then conducting. Uh, so so we uh, who then also controls the the technology because both of them are electronic soloists. Mm -hmm. So they they not just play the clarinet or conduct the orchestra. They also control everything in the electronics in real time. And I really mean everything. So everything is not everything is instrument, but everything is playable in real time. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, people listening are going to have to look at some of the video to really get an understanding of what we're talking about here, because <laughs> it does matter. Um, but it's it's a really cool merge-in of this kind of contemporary music world with the you know our, our normal like we got our conductor and we got our orchestra and everything, but then we bring it in the electronic element, the digital electroacoustic kind of thing, and it's. It was, I got to tell you, it was one of the first times I saw the gest, the, I don't mean to use gesture as in gesture, but like the kind of like using um, motion to control music where I said, oh, okay, that's cool. <laughs> because in, in the Polar Talk video, I, I love the drama in which you present it. It's almost like you, you have the connect. So I, I understand, the way I understand it, I guess it's sending MIDI messages to gesture and so it it's plays, yeah i almost felt like i was watching like an x-men or avengers movie <laughs> where you, you throw your hand out and like the sound comes in you pull it away and it's like you know like this force and and there's a obvious direct connection to what you're doing and what i'm hearing exactly and with the clarinet player martin frost right um he really makes it interesting because he's playing and then he's doing something and and it's a really like physical performance and it it's i gotta say it was like one of the first times where i've been like oh like now this is starting to turn into something where oh, so it's not just like a filter here <laughs> it, it's starting to seem like it's not just a gimmick it's part of the composition and part of what makes it, it, it it's, it's been a long journey to to come to this because as i said i developed the technology or something like that. So I've been using this for composing since then. And I have tried a few times to use, use it live in pieces as well because the app has been around for six years. Uh, and I things work, but I never found a way of making it really connect and really work together. And I think that the meeting with Esa Casal and Martin Prost, they were, it was really crucial to, to meet because they are, they are the world leading in, in their fields. They, they really, they, they are the best. <laughs> so uh, we can start from there that they know the, the, their ordinary stuff. And then we can see all the like deep questions behind. The first thing Martin first asked me was, okay, so yeah, we have the orchestra and we have me as a soloist and we have this virtual orchestra. Why? Hmm. Why should we have a virtual <laughs> orchestra? <laughs> and it's, of course, it's a silly question uh, because we can't know, but it's, it's a really important question. <laughs> Because if you if you don't have an answer to it, if if you haven't thought about it if you haven't really it can be you can have very simple uh, answers to it but you need to think about that question so because he's been doing things with movement things with where you go and the, the grand casa the, the drum player go boom so it sounds it, it looks like he he plays drums in the air and what's the difference? Uh, so I was thinking a lot about that and we talked a lot about it and we, we tried th different things uh, and one analogy that I came up with is to think of it as theater and film because in, in the theater uh, there are you have a, a presence a closeness to the to the actors and you are there and it's physical and you can do lots of things with wires and, and uh, scenography and to, to make lots of illusions but everyone still know that it's there and it's an illusion and in, in, in the movie, in, in the film, you, you can have, of course, it's, it's, it's a distance. It's something on the screen, uh, but you can do completely new worlds that are not possible to do in any other way. And that's the difference between acoustic music and electronic music. You can create new types of worlds with, with the electronics, and especially with this. And when you try to blur the lines, as I do, uh, to, to have, I compose, the orchestral score with a setting in the instrument. And then I ask the conductor to play live on the instrument on the same setting that I used to write the orchestral score. 
So we have like a, a multi-layered version of the same type of material. Mm. Uh, and those kind of things are really interesting. Uh, but going back to this first question, why? Uh, it can be as simple as uh, things that you can't otherwise do. Uh, so you have a solo clarinet player playing together with a choir of 16 clarinets that, that plays the same type of melodic material that he does. Of course, you could do that with the orchestra, but it's unpractical because usually they don't have 16 clarinets. So it's, it's very expensive to have a production with 16 clarinets. But those kind of things, very simple answers to that. Another answer would, would be to do things that is humanly impossible to do. Rhythmic complexity on the level that is just, it, of course, you can do something similar to it with just like more or less random notes, but this kind of super, super tight uh, complexity is really impossible. That's another answer. Oh, to do new sounds or this is, there are many answers but you need to, to define them and you need to think about them and the, not, the other thing that we talk about from the start is that it has to be crystal clear that he's playing there has to be no doubt whatsoever no one uh, should at any point be thinking oh it's probably this computer guy sitting and doing something at the computer right. uh, it has to be clear from the start he is playing and that's always been like uh, such an important part of, of, of uh, this project. Because that, I had that in, in some other projects. Uh, you, you have someone doing gestures and you hear some things, uh, especially if it's a conductor. Uh, so sometimes the, the gestures are to the ensemble or the orchestra, sometimes they are to, to, the, to the motion sensors. And as an audience, you don't really know when, what is what uh, and how it comes together. So that was, uh, I think that's more, more of an issue when you have a conductor because the conductor has the, 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 the back to the audience and, and doing lots of movements all the time and then doing other movements as well. And that's why I wanted in this project, uh, emerging from currents and waves as the, the full piece is called, uh, we had a visual element from the start. So everything that the Kinect camera sees are visualized uh, over the orchestra on the custom built uh, interactive light uh, sculpture that we made. Uh, so, so you really you also get a visual feedback because I don't think it's a problem for the listener, uh, for the radio listener. You hear the music, and the music sounds like the music sounds. But yeah. when you see someone doing lots of things and you don't know really know what is what, then if you if you get this kind of of uh, physical or the, the visual feedback, I think it's really important. Well, I'm glad you're addressing that because a issue I have with a lot of shows I see these days, bands, whatever. Um, I don't always know what I'm hearing, you know, like mm. you go and see a band and you know, there's a backing track doing something and there's a few musicians on stage and like, you're like, what, what am I hearing that's being played? What is, what are they playing to? Like, are we just stuck to like, kind of like the computer timeline, just moving at its steady tempo? There's no mistake that mm. could ever happen. And it, it feels frustrating to me. And it's so funny that I even say this as someone that performs electronic music. <laughs> like I, I wrestle with it like crazy. I want it to look like I, I'm doing something and I want the audience to feel like this is something that's happening here today and it could be totally different the next time and it'll never be the same. And that's an issue with, with technology. That is, a, that is a problem because if you have an acoustic instrument, you see and hear what that person is. But as have something that is, could be doing something more like, okay, you need to press one button on the computer and you can have a one hour piece and no one else does anything. So of course, it's, it's, it's tricky. Uh, and it's uh, one of those things that sometimes it doesn't matter. Uh, and sometimes it might do. So. Yeah. Well, I think it matters less when it's maybe just like one or two people and they're mm -hmm. obviously doing their digital thing and you're like, cool, yeah. you know? Yeah. But when it's the band <laughs> and there's a guitar, there's the bass player, there's a key player, and then there's this other stuff, and I don't know where it's coming from. That drives me crazy. Like it's, the, and, and it makes it hard for me to combine electronic and acoustic music. Yeah. And it's something, I, I love to do it, and that's part of the fun, but it, I, it's, it's more difficult than I ever thought it would be. You know, I just thought, oh, cool, I'll layer synths in a drum machine and play my acoustic guitar and it'll be great. But then it's like, eh, something, yeah. something else needs to happen to make this mm. make sense. Or, or it just it depends on, of course, on, on the context and on the, on the type of music because you can see many different, uh, if you have one 
person who is like the, the, the projector and the presenter of, of the music, so even if it's just uh, the, the, the vocalist or the solo guitarist or whatever, who is like, this is the focal point. And then the rest might not, you might not need to see the violas in the orchestra or, or the, the percussion player in the, in the rock band. It's like, it, it's not really the, the main thing. It's important for the sound, of course, but it's not maybe the main thing. So uh, you could think of it as, as, as long as you have, if the context is is uh, is presented in in a in a coherent way, it works anyway. But I totally see your point, and and as a musician, I think that that's something that we think about also. That we okay, but what we want to understand and we want to 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 take it apart and, and understand it. Yeah, yeah, because I mean that's why we go to the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're we're going to see the music too. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. And like you said, it's very easy to have the computer guy hit play and then I'll just pretend I'm doing something over there. <laughs> and it, I, I think like that feeling of am I being tricked is really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really cool that you're you're using that as part of like your your overall philosophy and what you're doing. Because mm. that is, um, you know, I think especially with the type of music you're doing is important. Yeah, I think so too. It's because also it depends on who you're doing it for, of course. And, and uh, contemporary music, I work a lot with, with the special ensembles for, for just contemporary music uh, in Germany and France and, and also in the States. I've been working with, with the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players, that's a group and, and other places. It's been, they have an audience for that type of music and they have the, as we talked about before, they have the, the, the knowledge and the references to, to understand and to get a grasp of, of, of what that is. But when you start working with symphony orchestras, <clears throat> most of the audience uh, comes, uh, comes there regularly. They come for, for Beethoven or for Brahms or Mahler. That's their references. Yeah. And I, uh, both, I, I totally respect that. And I also know that that is not my complete reference. I have, my, it's closer for me to, to put on Meshuga uh, than it is to put on Brahms, even if I love both. But what I listen to in my daily life is something else. And then to, to find a way of, of not, uh, not limiting yourself and not doing something for someone else, but still understanding the context and understanding and seeing, okay, how, how is this possible? How can we, talking about tricking yourself as a composer, how about tricking the audience or, or like a, making them see things that they didn't know they liked. Yeah. That's also something that is, is really nice if, if you can. Yeah, those are some of my favorite musical experiences, actually. When, when I hear something, I was like, oh, wow, I didn't realize how cool this is. Or <laughs> exactly. Like, it's because then it's like this whole world just opened up. There's exactly, exactly. More, more of this and see what's going on here. Yeah, yeah it's enriching. And that, yeah, it's hard. And <laughs> I've... I read something recently about how a lot of our musical tastes get cemented in our adolescence. Mm, yes. I had a conversation with someone about that where, yeah, I still love the bands I loved when I was 14. <laughs> and and I, maybe that's part of why it feels hard to find new music that really connects with you. Yeah, maybe. But that's set, certainly like um, a fun part of the whole music experience, whether it's writing or listening, when you surprise yourself, like, oh, nice, that's that's something new that I didn't know I liked. Yeah, and that, that's what I feel also with, with e, e, being a composer of, of contemporary music, uh, at least in, in some countries in Sweden and in some other areas, it's very, in the orchestral music scene, uh, it's become more and more uh, backwards looking. Uh, because of this, because the audience who comes there comes for the, the, the classics and then the composers of today, they take that in and then they do, the like, or it's, it's not that they adapt to that, but they, they, the orchestras choose composers who are in that area more, more looking backwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, like everyone do their own choice and it's perfectly fine. For me, that's never been interesting uh, either in rock music or, or, or in, in uh, contemporary music or classical music. I think it's it's all just to have someone who is trying to look forward uh, and maybe not succeeding at all, or maybe maybe doing something that someone else did, they didn't know about. But at least it's just some kind of of, of uh, direction mm -hmm. or drive that has, has this forward-looking uh, aspect. I, I I personally like that. And that's uh, what I'm trying to do, even if I'm not sure if, if I could succeed or not, but that's really my aim. 
Uh-huh. You, you got to wonder if like, uh, say like Mozart or someone came back to the future to see us and he'd be like, you still playing that shit? <laughs> this is the first time in history that uh, we are not just playing the contemporary music. Mm-hmm. They were only playing the contemporary music in the Baroque area, in the classic area, in the Romantic area. In the late Romantic era, they started looking back a little bit and they pulled up some, but it was still, the main thing was contemporary music, new music of our time. That was what was being played. Uh, so it's really, it's a, it's a, it's a completely sort of the classical music scene. It's very different from at any time in history. Uh, which makes very it makes it very strange. We talk to people who say we should not do contemporary classical music because it's, it's strange because we should only do the classics. That was never the truth before. That was never the case before. <laughs> but it's very very strange when you're looking at it. And of course, you, sh- you should play the classics. It's fantastic music, and it's great that we have the possibility to to still listen to old recordings and to to do new interpretations of, of all these fantastic masterpieces. That's great. Mm-hmm. But we also need to have something that that is developing yeah do you get a little pushback with that because i mean you're definitely challenging the status quo with what you're doing do you find that there's a little resistance it it, again it's it's context it's so much context because uh i have heard myself being described as super avant-garde and as being a, a, a lousy traditionalist uh, depending on who who is listening, <laughs> so it, it, in a it's, way, it's almost the same thing, I guess. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's uh, and I, I have this experience. I always uh, I, I think that story is so great because I just started to finish my studies and I was starting to work more and more in France. Mm-hmm. And I had this piece that was played. It, it was premiered in France uh, by a chamber ensemble, and then it was played two weeks later in Sweden by a different ensemble. And in France, <laughs> the musicians, uh, they, they like the music, but they say, you are not finished. There's so much detail that we don't know in the score. You've left so much free and up in there for, for grabs. And so you should really work on the details and we'll, we'll go through it so, so it's a proper composition. Two weeks later, same piece, uh, the Swedish ensemble thing. Why are you overloading your score with so much information? We can't play the music because there's so many details all over. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Context, right. reference, always. You ask. Right. <laughs> well, I guess that's the importance of like following yourself too, you know? Because yes, yeah, exactly, and, and to find <clears throat> because both of them have have their points, of course, and, and it, depending on how you look at it, and and some things uh, were lacking, and some things were overloaded, and, and uh, but it's it's really like how you look at things. Uh, mm. It's more important than what it actually is. Well, then, how do you know when to stop? Uh, <clears throat> I. I'm quite quite good at 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 the, the maybe it's because I always try to to have projects that I know when it's played and and I, I work towards uh, even if I'm trying to to not be uh, very, like deadline junkie and and to to be be rather well in advance when it's possible this large piece was impossible it was the first time where I was really starting to be late uh, I couldn't imagine it uh, that it would take so much work. Mm-hmm. Because it was it was a, a an orchestra piece of an, a, a little more than one hour, uh, which I knew would be a lot of work. But to have that in a fundamental way connected to the development of the electronics, because as I said, it was not not just instrument we used. We uh, custom made together with Ircam in Paris, the Center for Com- Computer Music. Uh, we we custom made some some ways for Esa Becca to be able to grab the sound of the orchestra, uh, freeze it move it around in space, move it around the audience, do loops wow. that were recording also both spatially. So, so his hand movements were, were taking the loops and moving them uh, through the 60 speakers that we had around the audience and to, to make these kind of things. Uh, so, so the entire, entire orchestra was, was uh, had microphones so we could really tweak the sound in many different ways. But for me, that was, okay, I wanted, I knew like the basic concept of, of what I wanted to do technologically and I knew on, on some level what I wanted to do musically but I couldn't do the music until I had the technology and I couldn't uh, develop the technology and less until I had the music so it was really like back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for such a long time 
so at the end it was really a uh, very very <laughs> tough period to, to to finalize the work and to finish finish it wow yeah I mean, it just sounds incredible and it, and it seems like the type of thing that you really need to be there to get the full experience for of course as, as always as with every, all, all musical experience i think that being there you have different things sometimes a, a, a radio broadcast of a concert can be uh, better in in one way because you, you hear more details and, and uh, as a musician sometimes i can prefer to to hear a recording of it because you can really hear all, all what's happening that you can't really do in the hall uh, and same for rock bands of course with with, with the just a huge sound and just a massive sound ball and, and or compared to, to hearing something where you can hear the details so it's pros and cons as with everything but yes uh, an old piece like this even if the visuals are in the back seat and they are part of, of expressing the music uh, it's still something that that is a, a multi-dimensional experience so of course in that way it's it's, it's, a, it's, it's a different thing when you're there hmm. wow it's incredible um like i said it's been a lot of fun exploring what you're doing and just really challenging how i think about music and how i think about composition and mm-hmm. kind of like um I, I mean it's such a it seems like something maybe that comes very simple or natural to you this idea that um in gesturement you kind of like put the rules of the song the comp the already written composition but mm-hmm. i approach gesturement as like all right this is uh parameters i'm gonna just improvise with and i just love that other way of thinking like it's almost like this like i said like i guess like that dream kind of thing and so i i really got to tell everyone and recommend they check it out um because it is a fun way to play with your sound and the architecture of your music and to explore new music too yeah, what I really like is what what we made with, with the pro version that we didn't have in, have in the original is that as that everything is mappable and everything is is moldable in real time. The small things like like uh, mapping range. Uh, so you 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 set each instrument set a uh, uh, maximum and uh, maximum uh, range and lower the highest and lowest range pitch range mm-hmm. or rhythmic range uh, with with pitch note note values. That's uh, as we had in the in the original version, but now this is also scalable, so you can have something that is uh, you're always in the scale, uh, but the melodies are growing organically within that scale when when you change the range, and that that is those kind of key features are things that I I, I just love to play on it because it it really makes for as you call it, remix. Uh, it, it's not a remix in that way, but it's really like you you play on the rules on, on the global global music in a way that i i really love really love yeah uh, i haven't had a chance to do the midi mapping but i'm very excited to now mm. because i think there's a lot of fun to be had yeah definitely and uh, of, of course with, with the, something like this i still find new things uh, all the time so it's like, okay oh well, this this could happen here so it's, it's, <laughs> it's in that way it has has depth that i haven't explored myself either awesome well i know we're getting near the end of our time so um, you've been very generous. I know it's very late at night for you. And um, I want to let you go get some rest because you are very busy with this release. Um, and it seems to be very well received. And I know for me, to be frank, um, there's so many apps that come out and so many are forgettable or not worth the time. And this is one of those apps that it's doing something interesting with the technology of the iPad or the touch screen. And even I, I never thought to hook the, the camera up to send MIDI to the touch screen interface. I mean, that's just, it, it's like starting to make sense to me now. <laughs> this gestural, <laughs> yeah, nice. like uh, kind of movement based music. I'm like, okay, I can see now there's some direction. <laughs> oh, that's great. Good. Yeah, that's great. Really talking to you. Oh, yeah. I, I really do appreciate getting a chance to talk to you and learn from what you're doing um is the best place uh, we got uh your website it's yes bernardine that's j e s p e r n o r d i n dot com dot com kind of your your home base but then there's also the gesturement site which is it's it's basically instrument but with a g e strument yeah. <laughs> gesture which is a great name by the way i thought that was pretty clever <laughs> 
It was it was tough to find a name, but adjust your instrument, of course, your people yeah. adjust. Them, so yeah, it fits it fits perfectly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, and um, yeah. So check out Jesterman, everybody. You'll have a lot of fun, and and definitely look at some of the work you're doing. Um, some of the music. Will there be um, any video of the emerging from Currents and Waves performance? Uh, I think there might be. There, there is. There is still. Uh, there is a, a video from the rehearsals that is uh, both on YouTube and, and on uh, Facebook on Berval Halland, the, 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 the venue. Uh, so that is possible to look at. Uh, and then there is some from from the other part with me and Martin Trust. We're, we're doing. Uh, I think there are several videos from that, or at least one on. On uh, so, so, uh, Euro news, right? Yeah, exactly, Euro news. Yeah. So, so there are some 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 things, uh, some excerpts. But hopefully, we'll get to play uh, the entire piece. Will be played at least uh, in Paris in in a year and a half, and then there are some other options. Uh, we're talking to, to different people, so yeah. we'll see when it's played again. And maybe okay. somewhere. We'll see. <laughs> oh, I'd love to go. I really would. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> well, Jesper, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening to the Music Production Podcast. Definitely check out Jesterman and Jesper Nordin's website. And really, um, lots of, I feel like uh, my musical world has been expanded thanks to you. So check it out. And have a great day, everybody. Take care.